All right, uh, our first presentation is going to be by me. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, Bitcoin, uh, cryptocurrencies in general, uh, what it is, why it's important, and how it won't save us. Um, first of all, how many here have heard of Bitcoin? Uh, and how many think they know what it is or can explain it relatively well? <laughs> okay. Uh, well, what I'm going to try and do with this presentation is going to, uh, there's a lot about Bitcoin. Uh, this is going to be more of a, a quick uh, summation of what it is and, and its implications for society in general. And uh, I just want you to come away. If you do have questions, I'd like to answer them. But what I want you to have at the end of this is more questions about uh, money and society in general. Um, and uh, you know, think about what the implications are for um, the economy if we do uh, see the changes that this uh, technology could bring about. <clears throat> so what is Bitcoin? Well, it is a decentralized technology. Uh, and what does that mean? Well, it means that there is no uh, central authority. There is no, uh, there is no one person or one group or one government that can say, uh, this is our currency and this is what you can and can't do with it. This is where you can and can't send it. Uh, things like that. There is no one point of failure. There is no one bank that can uh, uh, be shut down or there is no one credit card company that can be hacked. Uh, that's what decentralized means. <clears throat> it's digital money. That means it can be sent anywhere with an internet connection. It can be sent anywhere with a radio connection. You can send it, uh, you can even send it on uh, in paper letters if you need to. You can uh, basically uh, do anything you need to with it across the globe or even beyond. Uh, what it has done is it ephemeralized money, which means that there is no, you don't need to have it in a vault, you don't need to have it in a bank, you don't need to have it in your mattress. It can exist anywhere and everywhere because it is uh, information. It can be stored on the internet in a public uh, ledger that is replicated many thousands of times uh, in the world. It's peer to peer, and that means that every node on the network is equal. There is no uh, one node over one group or one person that is above everyone else. No one has more authority or less authority than anyone else on the, on the network. It also means that you can lose peers and gain peers and the network will continue to survive with or without you uh, on the network. So it is anti-fragile in that respect. Uh, very much like the internet was designed to be anti-fragile. Uh, they designed it to be nuclear bomb proof, right? They wanted a system that would exist even if major cities were destroyed. They need a way to get uh, information across the world. And peer-to-peer uh, -peer networking uh, is what they invented. And that's what Bitcoin exploits. <clears throat> so at the very end of it is cryptocurrency. Now what does that mean? It is a currency that uses crypto cryptography to secure and verify uh, the money supply. Um, it uh, relies on mathematics and algorithms, computational algorithms, to verify and, uh, and ensure the integrity of the system as a whole. Now, what we have with our current monetary system is the Federal Reserve. And what they do is they get together in secret, they discuss what's going, out in, what's going on in the world, and they decide to either increase or decrease the supply of money or the interest rates, uh, as it were. And that's, as we've seen, not effective. Uh, they can choose to do whatever they want with uh, the money. And um, we've seen that that continuing infl inflation has caused a lot, of, a lot of problems. And the very last thing is that it is an open source software uh, program. That means anyone can review the code, anyone can add or change uh, the code, and anyone can adopt the code that they want. That means that uh, there is no one person telling everyone else what to do or how to act. You can write your own code and interact with the system. Uh, so there is no uh, central authority in that respect. <clears throat> so how does it work? Uh, well, first of all, uh, you have a computer program called a Bitcoin wallet or a Bitcoin client. And uh, you send out and receive messages. You can say, well, Armando wants to send uh, Ismail five dollars, 
And so he writes out that message, he signs it, and he sends it out to everyone. Everyone sees that message. And uh, what happens is, <clears throat> um, everyone receives that message. And they collect all the other messages that are going on. Like, Ismail sends uh, someone else five dollars, things like that. Um, and once they've sent those messages out into the network, everyone collects them and uh, verifies uh, that they're uh, correct. And this is done through very uh, difficult mathematics that I'm not going into today, but you can look it up. Uh, it requires, <coughs> excuse me, requires the electrical curve uh, digital signal signature algorithm, um, the secure hashing algorithm, and the IPMD message digest. Uh, you can look those up uh, if you want. Um, and basically, all of these hard mathematics are what and verify uh, the integrity of the messages being sent. And if someone were trying to assume Armando's identity and say, uh, I want Armando to send five dollars to someone else, I can't. Like if I wanted to say that, I can't because I don't have his signature, his uh, crypto, his uh, cryptographic keys. Uh, so that that is what enables um, the security of the system. Now, once everyone gets these messages, they do have to go through and see, well, does Armando have five dollars? And they look through Armando's uh, previous history and they say, well, uh, someone else gave him ten dollars before and he hasn't spent any of it, so I guess he can give five dollars to uh, Ismael. And that's what uh, they use the mathematical uh, structure called the Merkle tree to uh, do that. They have a record of every single transaction and message that's gone across the network. They've saved it and they look through it to make sure that no one is cheating the system. That's, uh, that's also how uh, you verify the integrity of the system. Now we come to the uh, part where people, uh, their computers called miners, uh, what they do is they take all those messages and they say, they verify them and they say, okay, at this time, on this day, all these messages, all these transactions occur and uh, we're going to add them to the public the digital asset ledger, which is the blockchain. Um, people, they, the miners uh, verify that, uh, and they go through a very uh, difficult uh, hashing algorithm to prove uh, that they have added these, uh, that these messages are valid, and that these events occurred at this time of this day. Uh, it's called a proof of work system. That means is no one can cheat the system. Uh, you have to expend a great deal of computational power in order to add messages to the network. And um, over time, that grows. And uh, we'll see here in a bit that it's grown a lot. Uh, it uses the SHA-256 uh, hashing. And um, another thing is that the supply of money, the, these miners are rewarded by getting issued new bitcoins or new currency at a defined rate and with the limited supply, as opposed to the current system of the Federal Reserve, which is, uh, you know, just printing as much money as they can uh, all day, every day, uh, not doing anything for that, and then decreasing the value of everyone's money uh, as we go on. Uh, over the last 100 years, the uh, dollar has lost over 99% of its value because of this uh, continual uh, printing of the dollar. Now, uh, before we go on, I just want to share this graph. This uh, shows the computational hashing power of the Bitcoin network. Uh, this started in 2009, or at the end, uh, and to, to the present day. Now, as you can see, all the way up to the end of 2013, uh, we've added 10,000 uh, terahashes. So terahashes, um, one trillion hashes per second. That's how many times they have to solve this difficult problem in order to, to add uh, entries to the ledger. Uh, we, no, that's just at the end of 2013. Today, we have more, more than tripled that to over 30,000 terahashes or 30 petahashes uh, per second. And that means that this is the most secure and the largest uh, distributed computing uh, network in human history. So uh, a lot of people have become uh, active participants in securing the network uh, by donating their computational uh, network and storage of bandwidth. 
so why is Bitcoin important? Why uh, is this little software program uh, and digital currency important going forward? Um, well, when the, when the internet started, I mean, no one really knew or understood what the internet was for. It, wasn't, it was only used by, you know, a niche group of people and uh, a lot of reporters and other uh, institutional uh, individuals indicated that they thought the internet would never go anywhere or do anything important because it was only for computers, it was very expensive, it didn't work very well, it was very slow, uh, and all of those things. <clears throat> But the thing is, though, is that Bitcoin obviates government's little authority over currency. Every other currency in the world is generally backed uh, by government authority. Uh, men with guns, basically, saying, uh, you will use this to pay your taxes, or uh, we will come and hurt you and put you in a cage. Uh, there is nobody within Bitcoin that is going to do that to you. No one is going to force you to use it. No one is going to force you to do anything with it. Um, it is a completely voluntary open source uh, system that you choose to participate in. Um, since there is no centralized governmental authority or control, uh, there is no one there to manipulate the money standard supply. No one can say, oh, well, <clears throat> you know, uh, the economy is not doing so well, so we're going to print more and more uh, bitcoins or cryptocurrency and uh, to help stabilize the economy. So your the value of the bitcoins in your wallet or the ones in your possession do not go down over time. Um, uh, it's, there's no, no one can tell whose bitcoins are whose. It's all pseudonymous, which means uh, I can say Armando pays this mail, but what I'm saying is an account number that is in Armando's control wants to pay five dollars to an account number that is in this man's control. And the only people who know who controls those numbers are not Armando and Ispan. No one else can say uh, who owns what because your names or identities are not attached to it. Um, that's an also important reason uh, to change the current system, which has our identity tied up in our banks and our credit cards. Uh, many of you might have heard of the hundreds of millions of people who got hacked via Target, Kohl's, and uh, other online or other retailers by having their credentials uh, leaked to um, malicious hackers uh, who got into their hardware. Uh, your identity is not in any way tied to uh, Bitcoin, uh, unlike those, uh, those uh, systems. <clears throat> uh, the system is far cheaper and more efficient than uh, the banks and credit cards we have today. Uh, the fees, the, um, the rates they charge you for keeping your money with them, uh, for using your checks or for uh, what they charge the merchants for using their services. All those percentages make the banks billions and billions of dollars over, over the course of the year. And what they've done is they've stagnated on their uh, ability to, to uh, innovate or to change or make the system more efficient. I mean, they still have banker's hours, which is half a day for five days a week. Uh, they don't, uh, they're, they're International clearances take days to get through, and there's hidden fees that sometimes hit people, so they have to end up sending more money due to um, due to those fees. There's no transparency in the banking system that uh, that allows you to know what's going on. Uh, but in Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies, um, there is no such hidden. Uh, there are no hidden. Systems or fees, everything is transparent. Let's see. The uh, the thing is that Bitcoin allow, is uh, promotes a behavior that uh, benefits the network as a whole. Uh, the creator um, it came up with a virtuous circle, meaning that uh, those who use it and contribute to it are rewarded uh, with uh, new currency and um, by making sure that the Net network is secure, uh, there is no incentive to attack it because you would need far more uh, hashing power than the network had by itself. And as we've seen, it's been growing so fast that no one person or group could possibly uh, have that much power at their own control. Uh, so it's far safer than banks. Uh, people can 
go in and rob a bank. People can go in and uh, assume your identity and take your money. All of these things um, people can't do with uh, Bitcoin, assuming everything is uh, done securely and correctly. <clears throat> Another thing is that the volunteers of the system are the ones that operate it and the ones that uh, vote about what uh, software and what, uh, what behavior is going to be on the network. Um, what that means is the people who run the software, who mine uh, the, the currency, they're the ones who have a say in uh, uh, what, what's going to happen. Uh, and they're volunteers, so no one is forcing them to be there or do, do this or that. So effectively, if everyone uh, decides that they want to have more Bitcoins than the 21 million that are programmed in the system, everyone can do that. They can choose to run the software that says that is the case. But no one individual can dictate that to others. Um, so that is a far more democratic way to run the monetary system than what we have right now. <coughs> Um, this is the ephemeralization of monetary uh, systems and finance. Uh, one thing that Bucky, uh, Buckminster Fuller discussed was the ephemeralization of, uh, of production of goods and services to people so that the fact that uh, it takes far less resources, uh, time, and, and, and um, cost to produce an item for a person means that uh, society would, should get more leisure time and, and be more free to do what it is they want to do. Um, but as we've seen, that hasn't happened. But with the monetary system, it extremely hasn't happened because they still have banks, accountants, uh, tax attorneys, all these, uh, all these people in these buildings uh, doing all of this work just to track numbers. And they have not automated that to a sufficient degree that uh, we can ephemeralize it. But Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies have ephemeralized uh, finance and money. Uh, this creates economic opportunities for the under and unbanked around the world. There are billions of people who have no access to the economic system. They are exploited by it, but they have no access to act on it as a peer, as a person uh, just, as, uh, just as capable as you or me. Uh, we have banks and uh, we have credit cards, but most people in the world do not have access to that uh, economic uh, system. <clears throat> Another thing is that this technology has proven that there are solutions to a very difficult uh, a mathematical and computational problem called the Byzantine uh, generals problem, which means given a group of people who might otherwise be adversarial and who have no uh, direct communication with each other, how do they all agree on something? What, what, uh, what allows them to understand that this person paid this person that much money in that day and that time. Uh, there was no easy way to do that in the past. So there was no easy way to do monetary systems on computers or over the network uh, that didn't involve a central authority of some sort. But given that we've uh, solved this problem now, uh, we have many, many applications that can take advantage of it. Right now, currency is the first application of the Bitcoin protocol or network. Uh, this is like internet, <clears throat> we've created the internet and the first application was email. And many people will look at email and say, well that's, that's nice, but it doesn't do anything else. But over 30 years, look what it's produced over time. All the uh, exciting things about the internet that we have, that we have today. <clears throat> so, how it won't save us. I've spent all this time talking about how good and wonderful and amazing it is, but Let's look at why exactly it's not going to ultimately help uh, save us or solve many of our problems. It, con it continues to promote the monetary system of value. And as, we, as the Zeitgeist Movement notes and advocates, the, Zeit the monetary system of value is not sustainable culturally or techno techno technologically. It undermines itself over time due to the profit motive. Um, <coughs> It does not promote sustainability. It, in fact, it uses a great deal of energy to just use uh, the computer, the internet, to shuffle around numbers, right? There's nothing else that it's doing. That's all it's been doing. And um, because it's, a it's the result of a distorted value system in which money is more important than anything else. There are many 
distributed net, uh, computing uh, networks out there that are doing good work, such as folding at home, um, you know, climate change uh, processing, uh, climate change research, things like that that are, that are up there, and many people are devoting resources to this money, uh, monetary system. Uh, so it's, you know, it's, it's drawing away work from progress, that's what I'm saying, in terms of uh, social health. <clears throat> it thrives on market efficiencies. Right now, the reason it's, it's successful is because banks and credit cards are so inefficient and costly. Um, that's, that's the only reason why it is um, being used and being valued at the rates it is. And without you know, those market inefficiencies in other areas of the market, then it wouldn't be so successful at its current application. As with all monetary systems, it increases and maintains uh, inequality socially and technically. Um, those people who have access to the needed technology to use Bitcoin uh, are the ones that are profiting the most right now. Uh, they are the ones who are getting the most use out of it. <clears throat> uh, in order to use it, you do need access to significant technology. You need the internet, you need some type of computational device of some sort. Um, uh, there are claims that you can use it with a cell phone, but that requires centralization of some sort. Your cell phone with SMS messages cannot, you know, secure or comp uh, compute the whole uh, network or blockchain. So you would have to rely on a third-party service and we go back to where we are right now in terms of banking institutions and things like that. The people who have wealth are able to invest that wealth into more computers, better computers, and um, start businesses and services that accept this currency, um, getting, thereby getting themselves more wealthy. Uh, that's the point of the monetary system. And so that's just going to continue and heighten the inequality, the past inequality we see today. Let's see, we do uh, continue, uh, due to market pressures, uh, tend towards monopolies, oligarchies, cartels, uh, and factions. Uh, there is no um, unifying pressure other than to contribute to the network. And even so, uh, the, the Bitcoin network can be fractured by uh, those individuals who want different things at different times or, or different systems. Um, right now we see many different cryptocurrencies coming in the wake of Bitcoin. There are things like Litecoin, um, Fork. There are many, there are many like 200 or so uh, cryptocurrencies now competing with Bitcoin. And that's just drawing more and more computational power away uh, from worthwhile causes and, uh, you know, uh, just uh, devaluing the cryptocurrency space in general. Because essentially there are an unlimited number of numbers, right? I mean, that's all these things are. It's just numbers. And uh, people are spending a great deal of time and money just computing numbers. Um, so it's, it's, that's one of the main problems of uh, Bitcoin. But here's how it can help us. There are ways that it can help us as the Zeitgeist Movement or people of conscience. Uh, it encourages an honest discussion about money and monetary policy. Uh, there are many people right now uh, asking, what is money? Because when people hear Bitcoin, they say, well, it's just numbers on the internet. What is that? How is that money? And when people begin to understand it, well, money is just an idea. It's what we apply to a piece of paper or a piece of metal. It's not a real thing. And Bitcoin is going to get and generate a discussion that says, well, if money is just an idea, what, why do we let it control so much? You know, that, that is my hope. But there are many people, uh, podcast, uh, every single financial uh, newspaper and blog is saying, having a discussion about what money is. And moreover, they're just starting to say, well, what is fiat currency? They talk more about fiat currency now than they ever have in the past. What is uh, the Fed policy? All these things that uh, no one has ever discussed or talked about, but you're now interested in because there is a competing uh, system uh, that has a comparison and contrast with what uh, is going on right now. It pr produces a useful technology and paradigm. Um, so if you create software that people want to use, they'll contribute to it. Uh, we see it with uh, SETI at home, we see it with folding at home, we see it with all these things. And if you 
if you produce a behavior that rewards people, and that's what the point of the Bitcoin software does, it rewards you for contributing uh, to its security, um, then people will use it a great deal. Um, also, there is no central authority and everyone who participates votes on what's happening. This is a decentralized uh, technology that the Venus Project could very readily use for to uh, help promote a resource-based economy. One of the problems uh, that they face is that we rely on uh, rational consensus of uh, what is going on in the world. And if we can transform reality into a blockchain of sorts, then we can all agree upon what happened at different parts of the world at the same time. Uh, resource uh, tracking and, and usage, all of these things that uh, we need to do, we can do now because we have the uh, technology to do so. <clears throat> alternative currencies create significant change in societies that adopt them. There are many alternative currencies around the world that promote behaviors that are beneficial to that society or to make up deficiencies for the the official currency of that, of that area. Uh, there are Ithaca dollars, there are time banks around the world, there are currencies that promote people cleaning up the streets. If you bring in a bag of your garbage, you can go on the bus for free, things like that. And uh, these complementary currencies, uh, these alternative currencies, are enabling change that otherwise would not have happened uh, around the world. Uh, there are actual currencies right now, cryptocurrencies that promote beneficial behavior, solar coin is a cryptocurrency that promotes uh, solar power production. If, um, if you produce solar power, you get rewarded in this currency. And uh, if you might, then you can expend it uh, as a unit of uh, solar power. So um, there are currencies and applications, uh, there are currencies and applications for this uh, technology that promote uh, behavior that we want to see, alternative energies and, and the like. Uh, Prime coin is an example of uh, a currency that is being mined and used to <clears throat> used to create uh, prime numbers that didn't exist before, that people had discovered before. Um, Main coin is an alternative to the DNS system, which has historically been controlled by governments. Uh, if you want to publish a website, you have to go through a government, which is uh, through a company that is controlled by the, the government authority. But now you can. Uh, publish any website you want at your own uh, on your own computer at home and share it with Namecoin, and uh, you can be uh, a public, you can have a, a website of your own that is not accountable to any company or government. Uh, that's important for places that have very uh, restricted governments and uh, dictatorial regimes that don't want you to have your own website. And then the final point is that change encourages more change. Now that we have this new technology that's changing the current economy, uh, there's going to be further changes going on online. One of the things that Bitcoin technology enables is uh, a voting system that is completely decentralized but very fairly fair. Uh, there is no more black. There can be no more black box voting. There can be no more um, uh, control of those kinds of institutions. Uh, that, that, you know, take everyone's consent and then does with it behind closed doors what they want with it. Um, there are many, many things that uh, can happen with this technology, and I think it's something to be positive about um, in the future. Well, while Bitcoin is not going to save us, the underlying technology will certainly help us in the long run. Uh, so I'll be glad to take any questions uh, that you have right now. Uh, I think it's important to uh, to note some of what would be considered negative things, but really aren't negative. I know you had a list on there, like for example, uh, with banks, right? Let's say somebody can hack my account. Yeah. They can take my money and the bank will replace it, right? Where with Bitcoin, they can't, even if you lose it, because it's gone, right? That's right. But the important issue there, I think, is the fact that the bank replaces it by creating more currency, because right. you know, so all you, all that, somebody's stealing money from me, and the bank replacing it, or when the bank says that they'll cover, you know, like that they rob a bank, they can cover you up to I think a hundred grand or whatever. All that's going to do is just devalue the currency yet another step and, a, and another step. So that's even right. though we have those 
securities, you know, all it really just leads to is more uh, devalued currency. And uh, another thing, uh, like with Bitcoin, right? Let's say you know you were talking about voting, and it's more of an you know more accurate or, or to whatever degree. More transparency. More transparency. Yeah. If I had, uh, if I was a wealthy Bitcoin person, you know, and I wanted to buy politics or whatever, I literally have to give up my Bitcoins and lose, and my my monetary value goes down. Where now, I mean, if a bank wants to buy a politician, I mean, banks have what they call, I mean, they can write checks without having money in the bank because the other banks got to cover it. So they can write a $1 million check to, to me to go do something for them and, and lobby for them without having to really spend or without, really, without even devaluing their lifestyle to some degree. I don't know if that makes sense. Whereas a Bitcoin well, they person- They steal from everyone else by creating them. Yeah, well, as a Bitcoin, hey, you know, I gotta pay this guy 1,000 Bitcoins. I'm out 1,000 Bitcoins. Let's hope he does it, you know, that's it. I'm out 1,000 Bitcoins. I can't, I can't just write a blank check of 1,000 Bitcoins because when you go and you get aid, hey, where are the Bitcoins? It didn't come through, you know? Where with the banking system we now have, you know, they, banks can literally write blank checks without ever worrying about if it's gonna get covered because it's, a lot of it is digital currency also. Oh yeah, the, the vast majority of our current uh, currencies are over 97% computerized and digital money. Uh, there is very little paper and coin money in terms of uh, the overall uh, my, um, money supply. Um, yeah, that's a good point. And moreover, I'm talking, I mean, in terms of voting, I'm not talking about just you know, spending bitcoins to vote. There are, there are ways to set up a system where everyone gets, you know, a number basically, and, and no one really knows what that number is, but you, everyone supposedly gets one. Um, and you can expend that number in, uh, in the network verifiably saying I vote for this person and then they will get that so they will get that vote and everyone can see that this number went out to everyone and this number came in back and, and all that stuff but no one's identity is tied to it in any point. Um, that's the kind of democracy, democracy that might exist in the future. Um, but of course, you know, the Zeitgeist movement promotes no state of any sort. We promote uh, stateless classes uh, society. Um, Thank you, Ramon. Any other questions? You said Bitcoin's being used right now? Yes, it's been in use uh, since 2009. That's when it was introduced. Well, how do you use it to buy like regular, ordinary stuff? Let's say you go to Walmart, can you use it for that? Uh, right now, I don't believe you can use it at Walmart. So, wait, what? I don't mean to cut you off, but so what can you use it for besides exchanging it with other people that are on the system? Well, being that it's only five years old, there are a limited, uh, right, well, it's a really limited number of use cases for it right now. Uh, there is a website, GIFT, G-Y-F-T, that has uh, gift cards for hundreds and thousands of uh, retailers. You can use it. To, they accept Bitcoin directly, and uh, they, you can use it with that. Uh, Tiger Direct, uh, many uh, online uh, retail shops uh, use it now. Tiger Direct, Overstock, um, Amazon, I'm sure, will follow suit one day soon. I, think uh, they, I thought our, somebody's post said they had just bought some stuff from Amazon. Uh, I, I think in different countries you can right now, like in the UK or the, in Europe, but um, in America, everyone, in America, the banks and the established players are very afraid of Bitcoin because of what it represents and what it means. And so they don't, the adoption is not as high. I mean, the person at uh, Overstock, um, the owner, uh, CEO, really likes it because he's a libertarian. I mean, he's, he doesn't like what the government is doing with monetary policy. And so his, his reasons are ideological. But he's been, his, him and his company have been making a great deal of money over time. Uh, so that's probably going to drive, uh, drive uh, uptake in, in the future. And uh, I didn't cover a great deal of the ecosystem because uh, that's not what I wanted to talk about today. But there are, it is a growing ecosystem. There are many, many more use cases uh, for it. I'm not, I'm not advocating anyone use it or buy it or anything like that. I just. Uh, I just wanted to let you know that this technology is out there and it's going to change a lot of things in the future more than likely. Yeah, maybe. I think if you do a search, you'll find a, a, cause I've done searches before, like, you know, who uses Bitcoin, you, you'll find, you may not be able to buy all the things you want, you know, 
It's maybe like an online thing right now. Right now, yeah. Well, mostly it's an online thing, but there are many restaurants that are taking it around the world. In Germany, it's big. Um, uh, the adoption will continue. And um, the thing is, many businesses like it because unlike credit cards, which take 3 to 5% of their cut, uh, yeah, of their yeah. revenue, uh, Bitcoin does not have those fees. It does not. And there are no chargebacks with a credit card or with a check. I mean, the check could be bad. A uh, credit card could be uh, reversed 30 to 60 days after the fact. So you are out your product and you're out your money in that case. And so these qualities of Bitcoin being irreversible and provably uh, correct, as in, you know, when I send you that money, that money is going to be sent to you. There's no way to reverse it given the immense power of uh, the network. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's uh, merchants are beginning to learn of these advantages. And um, I think that's going to be taken up uh, sooner than later. Yeah, well, I, I get what you're saying. It's kind of like it, it can be used kind of a, a transition system yeah, to get rid of monetary system. You're taking away the power of the Federal Reserve and all the other centralized monetary yes, uh, systems. Uh, that, is, that is my belief and hope that it is the beginning of the end of money. Because once we've ephemeralized money into bits of data, and we expend so much power and resources on, on that, and people are going to try to figure out what's the contradiction here? Why are we spending all of these resources on shuffling numbers around? What's, what's the point of that? And if this is money, I mean, if you have money as idea, why, why are we suffering so much? Why, why are we under so much debt, as it were? Where does all that debt come from? And why are we uh, suffering from it? So all of these questions and conversations are really uh, going to come up because of this technology. People are going to start questioning and wondering things they've never done before because they were never encouraged to. But now that there is a provably a useful system that obviates government authority and, and is far better than the banks, then they're going to start wondering uh, about these things. Anything else? Well, thank you very much uh, for uh, sitting through that. And, uh, I hope you learned something and I hope you have more questions.